Good morning. I have uh, two uh, stories to share with you uh, that both relate to being a dad. Uh, I have a comical one and a serious one. I'm going to save the comical one for later. In uh, our time together, I'll start off with <clears throat> a more serious story. Uh, I don't know. For, I think for parents, there's, there's a couple moments you might experience that just feel like a moment of desperation. They're very few and far between. They're very rare when you have that real moment of your heart just drops and sinks and it's a moment of desperation. I mean, with a, with a herd of small kids at home, there's usually just a general sense of frazzle and there's always tears and fears and cheers all happening at once. Uh, but there, a, a mindful experience comes to me of a moment of, of desperation. As a dad, it was August of 2019, uh, and, and some of you know the, the uh, circumstance, but our, our fourth uh, little Levi was born, and the next morning, the uh, pediatrician comes in to check him out, and by number four, you're like, yes, he's got 10 toes, he's got 10 fingers, uh, but there was alarm. Right away, he says, I've, I've not seen this before. I look in his left eye, and I cannot see a pupil. Uh, we need, I, I've already set you up. You're pack up right now. You're heading to Hershel, Hershey Medical Center today. You need to go. I don't know what this is, but it is serious. Uh, it could be a tumor. It could be some other things. We need to check it out. I've already set you up. You, you need to go. There's a sense of desperation there. Uh, as the dust eventually settled, he did have uh, a one in every 100,000 babies are born with this condition called Peter's anomaly. His cornea doesn't function correctly in his left eye, and he'll never have sight the right way out of it. A surgery eventually gave him sight. We'll see as he grows up what kind of sight that is. But in the moment, we didn't know how the dust would settle, right? And maybe you felt this as parents. You're, you're packing up. There's a bit of tremble. You're thinking through every single circumstance. You're trying to comfort your wife, comfort yourself. Just trust the Lord. But hope is in the Lord ultimately. And secondarily, there's a doctor, I guess, at Hershey who has the authority in this realm. And we got to get to him because that's where the answers are, right? Medically speaking. I think in our text today, that's what we see. Did you notice it? There, there's a sense of desperation here, particularly from, from a, a dad who has, has a child. And I, I hope you noticed it. Would you, would you take a look at uh, the scriptures? I, I invite you to open up your Bible. Often on campus, I'll say, uh, turn in your Bible or turn on your Bible. To, uh, and in your pew Bible, it's uh, page number 866. Uh, I invite you to turn in your own Bible or the Pew Bible, but I'll, I'll reference phrases and verses often in here, so I, I invite you to be looking at it. You also have a <clears throat> little outline in your bulletin printed for you as well, if that would serve you and, and help you follow. But did you notice the two characters? I, I want to point them out to you. There's two characters here that have the significant interaction with Jesus. Verse 41, let me draw your eyes there. I think the author provides for us here in these two characters a, a picture of faith. And that's number one there in your outline, a picture of faith. And here, here, verse 41, here, here's the two characters. There came a man named Jairus, another character in 43, and there was a woman. Not given a name, right? We understand this man's name is Jairus. He's significant. He's a leader in the synagogue. And we have then an unnamed woman. These are our two characters, but you see what they have in common. Maybe nothing else they have in common in this whole story. We see them as very different, but what they have in common separately, individually, they, they each have a serious need. Did you see it? Did you see the need, the serious need they each have? Verse 42, for he had an only daughter about 12 years of age and she was dying. The, the unnamed woman given for us, again, 43, here's her need. Do you notice it? And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. Uh, maybe one at a time, I want to I wanna invite you to look with me how each of them take action because of their need. Do you see it? They have a great need. I want to show you here how each of them take action out of their need. Verse 41, what, what does Jairus do? 
And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house. Jairus here is falling, he's begging, he's imploring Jesus, running right up to him, begging Jesus to come quickly to his house for the sake of his daughter. And you see how this is directly tied to, he's taking this action out of his need. I can't imagine my daughter, I have two, but he's an only daughter, and she's 12 years old, and she's dying. This is it. And so he, 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 he finds Jesus. And the author, I think, deliberately describes this and positions what, what Jairus is doing, the action he's taking here, in contrast to something. Do you see what it's in contrast to? Jairus' actions are in contrast to what, to what the crowd is doing. Do you see the crowd? Notice the details of the, the crowd. The author uh, describes this about the crowd. In verse 40, now when Jesus returned, you see this, the crowd welcomed him. Notice what they say, for they were all waiting for him. There's no falling, there's no imploring, there's no begging, there's no running to find Jesus. The crowd is, well, they're standing around, they're checking their uh, sundial on their wrist. And they, when Jesus comes, there's no begging, there's no imploring, there's, they, they welcome him. Welcome, Jesus. Glad you're here. Why are they just welcoming him? Well, because they're, wait, they're waiting for him. They're waiting around. They can't wait till Jesus arrives at them, right? Why isn't Jairus just welcoming Jesus' arrival? Because when Jesus arrives, in Jairus' mind, he's not yet where he needs to be. He's not going to welcome Jesus. He's going to find Jesus because they have somewhere to go. Jairus, like, and not like the crowd, is not waiting for Jesus. He's finding Jesus. Do you see the difference there? Jairus is not waiting around for Jesus to arrive. He is finding Jesus. Uh, let's look at the woman's actions she takes out of her need. Do you notice this? I think the author gives great detail to the woman's actions she takes now based on her need. Let me read to you uh, 44 through 47. And she came up behind him, being Jesus, and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him and declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. Do you see, do you see the action she takes out of her need? It, it, the way that the author tells the story, it's as if with all the strength she might have, the dignity she might have left, the dignity she can muster, she grasps just the fringe of his garment as he walks by. That's just the slightest chance she'll take it. Notice again how the author positions this detail for us in contrast to the crowd. Do you see it? Jesus stops everyone right in 45 and says... Who touched me? I don't, I don't know if you can picture the image here. This is pretty laughable. I do laugh out loud when I read this. There's a crowd, and Peter even, even points it out, right? Pressing in on Jesus. My wife and kids and, and, and my, my mother-in-law were together uh, a, a little while ago at the, at the farmer's the, the, the farmer show, the farm show down in, in Harrisburg, right? And if you've ever been there, but they were there at a time, maybe most times are like this, they're just trying to get uh, a couple dozen yards to the next thing, and yet it's, the hallways are so packed with people. You have someone pressing in on you on this side. You have someone pressing in on you on this side. You have people right in front of you, and there's people waiting right behind you. And those aren't even your kids, right? These are just other people, right? And they're all pressing like that. And this is the crowd Jesus is in. He's got people everywhere all pressing and bumping as he tries to move through the crowd, and he stops everyone. Who touched me? What's Peter's answer? Everyone, right? Every, Jesus, everyone touched you. Why are you asking who touched you? 
But Jesus says only one person drew power from Jesus. He says one of these touches was different. And Jesus makes this at a public occasion. He, he publicly draws this woman out. And he, he gets her story. And he gets her story for everyone to hear. Not just for him to hear, but this is for the crowd to hear. And then he tells the crowd and her what that one touch, that everyone's pressing in on him, but one person actually touched him. And that actual difference, Jesus tells us in verse 48. Do you notice it? What's the difference made? Why was that one touch different? Faith. What does all of this mean for us? How, how Jairus' action he takes out of his need is different than the crowd who just waits and welcomes. That the woman's action she takes out of her need is different than the crowd. She was touching him just like the rest of them, right? No. The difference here, what does all this mean for us? The author gives us a picture of faith. This is how faith is depicted for us in this story. This is what faith looks like, a, a, a desperation. Did you see it? These two characters have a deep need, and so out of a desperation, they find Jesus. You can write it in on a blank there in your outline. Faith is a desperate trust. Faith is a desperate trust. If faith is a desperation, a desperate trust, then what's faith in Jesus? It's your desperation brought to Jesus. Friend, does this describe your faith? You have, a, you have a deep sense of your need. That your, your faith typified by a desperation for Jesus. How does all of this apply to us? Maybe a diagnostic question again would be, are you desperate for Jesus or are you just crowding him? Are you desperate for Jesus, or is it it's just so easy to be part of the crowd bumping up against him? But that meaningful connection, the actual access to Jesus himself, it doesn't come through proximity to Jesus. It comes by a desperation for him. And that's why these two characters have an actual meaningful, substantial connection with Jesus. Do you struggle, like I do, to, to just be regularly in the scriptures. How, how's the, the, uh, the Bible plan for the year going so far here on February 5th? We're just a month in, right? Do you find it hard to be disciplined enough to be in the scriptures each day? If the answer might be yes, it's not that you're not disciplined enough. You're not desperate enough. You know what actually finds Jesus through all the others that are meaning to be around him? Desperation cuts right to the chase. Discipline will take you a, far, a, a long way. You know what takes you further? Desperation. If you were desperate for Jesus, that Bible would be easily opened. But often, it stays closed. We're just not as, we just don't sense our need. It's one thing in a crowd like we did to sing, I need thee every hour. It's a different thing to mean it. It's so easy I think, to just be in proximity to Christ in a crowd, in a crowd mentality, um, than it is to actually find him and connect with Christ. And the difference is sensing your deep need. Uh, beyond a picture of faith, I want to show you in this passage the power of Jesus. Point number two there on your outline, the power of Jesus. The author highlights Christ's power. I think we see it in a number of ways. First, Jesus' power, it restores unlike any other. I want to take a moment with you, if you'll look with me. Notice the resources of these two characters. In verse 41, notice Jairus's resources at hand. There came a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue. Jairus had position, again, a ruler of the synagogue. He had reputation, position, a degree of power or money. This man had a church family, lots of friends. This man had tremendous resources, but there's one man he hadn't yet tried. 
And I don't know what that situation looked like, but at some moment he's there beside her bed with his 12-year-old daughter, with his only daughter, taking her by the hand, and he thinks, man, of all the stuff I have at my fingertips, this could be, nothing's working. My position, my power, my money, my, right, what, can, what can bring my daughter back to health? And at some moment, he thinks of Jesus. But Jesus isn't here. He's somewhere else. And so he has to leave his daughter. Honey, I'll be back. And hopefully, I'll be back with Jesus. And he has to leave her. Because in his mind, where's the authority? Where's the hope? Who's going to be able to? He's got to find Jesus. In verse 43, I think we see some aspects of, of this woman's resources the author mentions. You notice this, this woman and her resources. Uh, take your eyes to verse 43, if you would. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. Notice the three details, the three aspects the author gives us. Do you see them? She had the condition for 12 years. She had spent all she had on doctors. That's number two. And the third thing, she had not yet been healed. Notice how in a desperation and a finding Jesus, all three of those are, are, are turned the opposite way. Do you see that? Verse 44, she came up behind him, and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. So far, she had not yet been healed, and now healed. She had spent all her living on physicians, and this one is free. And she had her condition for 12 years, and upon trying Jesus, immediate. Jesus restores like any other. How about you? What are other resources that you've taken your desperation to? What are other resources other than Christ you find yourself putting faith in? And maybe at the end of the day, they just have you spent. Maybe other resources we hope in other than Christ could be position, could be money, could be reputation, or just could be this one, just yourself. And as you have a sense of desperation, have a sense of need, you try to have that restored and replenished with just the other things of life, even yourself. And it leaves us like this woman, she's just, just spent. Friend, in connection with Jesus through faith, he restores his power, himself. He can restore like any other can. The power of Jesus also is reflected in perfect timing. I want you to see this in the story as well. Verse 42. You, you get the sense in reading between the lines that Jesus agrees, right? He hears this man's begging, his imploring, his situation about his daughter. And so here we, in verse 42, do you see it? As they went, as Jesus went. So here we go. He's going to go with this man, Jairus, to his house. I don't know how far it is, but they, now they got a journey here. And, and as they went, the people pressed around him. You get, you get the impression it's kind of like an ambulance. Sirens on, let's get to the hospital, let's get to the need. But, uh, but an ambulance in traffic, right? Jesus didn't have the whole uh, mechanism that makes all the green lights happen, right? He's, the red light of the crowd is, is having him get there slowly. And as they went, the, the crowd pressed in around him. And all of a sudden, this is what interrupts it, right? As if the crowd didn't slow them down enough. Jesus now intentionally pauses. Do you see this? In verse 47, the woman reaching out and touching the fringe of Jesus' garment, drawing power from him to be healed, this interrupts Jesus getting to Jairus' daughter. Jesus paused for the woman. Let me read for you 47 and 48. And then the woman saw that she was not hidden and she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So Jairus is maybe right near Jesus with him, guiding him to his house. And Jesus has been slowed so far by the crowd. And now 
as Jairus maybe wants things to go faster, Jesus is now the one pausing. And he's drawing out this woman and making this incident with the woman public. And he asks her what happened. And she says that aloud for all to hear how she had touched Jesus and what her condition was and how she had been immediately healed. And you, get, you, you realize that Jesus isn't just publicizing this for him to learn something. Jesus isn't just publicizing this account with this woman being healed for, the, for just the crowd in general to hear it. Jesus wants Jairus to hear what's just happened with this woman. And right after that, right after verse 48, do you notice it? Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. What's the next thing that happens? Verse 49. While he's still saying the phrase, go in peace, there's another interruption. Do you see it? While Jesus is still saying that, verse 49, someone from the ruler's house came and said, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher any more. And Jairus gets the news that she has passed. His opportunity has passed. Did he, say, did he get to say goodbye, right? These are the things rushing through his mind and the grief in the news of what has just happened. And I read this and I, I, I linger on it for a while and I try to put myself on Jairus' shoes. I don't know if you feel the same way about how this could go down. But because Jesus pauses, because Jesus took the time for this woman, because Jesus got interrupted by this woman, by he, he intentionally makes this a, now a circumstance and a public uh, event. Because of it, they didn't get there on time. And J who knows what's going through Jairus' mind, but if anything like me, I'm thinking, hey, J Jesus, I came and I asked you. She didn't even ask. <laughs> right? Like, let's, how could you do this? Or, or she's been dealing with this for 12 years. She has time. You, you, could, you could have got to my daughter first. She doesn't have any time. Then come back for this woman. Why did you do this, Jesus? And, and the more you read the, the sequence of this, the more you realize this is exactly the perfect timing for what Jairus needs. Look how Jesus set this up. Jesus delayed for this sequence to lead to this moment. As Jairus is, is trembling and fearful next to Jesus in the crowd, Jesus has a moment here now for Jairus to hear. So he asks the woman, tell us, right, what happened? She says, I've been dealing with this condition for 12 years and just touching you instantly made me well. And then Jesus says what that was. He says, you know what that touch was? Faith. And faith in me made you well. And Jairus heard him say that. He's right next to Jesus. He's right in the crowd. That's why this is made audible. Jairus heard Jesus say, it's faith that made you well. And then automatically, the next thing Jairus hears after faith makes well, he hears your daughter has passed away. And then Jesus looks at him and says what? Hearing this in verse 50, do not fear, only believe. She will be well. So bang, bang, bang. This is the sequence Jesus set up. Daughter, faith made you well. Jairus, your daughter passed away. And then Jesus has the climactic moment of saying to him, Jairus, now you have faith. See what he did for the woman? We're going to go do the same thing. That word believe, do you see it in verse 50? It's the word faith. It's the same word. In English, we don't have a, 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 a verb for faith. Right? So you have to pick a different word. But in, but in the Greek, they have a, a, a a verbal form and a noun form for the same word, pistis, right? It can be uh, the noun faith or it can be the verb faith. But in English, we have to pick a different word, believe. It's the same word. Meaning, faith is what this woman ha had. And Jesus says to, to Jairus, faith is what you need. What does all of this mean for us? Friend, trust the timing of God. Not for the miracle of healing or the miracle of resurrection, but trust the timing of God for Jesus to show himself to be all that your desperation needs. Friend, through faith in Jesus, it's never over. Opportunity has never passed. Trust in his timing. Friend, trust the timing to be for his fame and for your good. He's orchestrating the sequence for him to show off how good he is, and he's doing it for your benefit. 
The power of Jesus, it restores like any other. The power of Jesus is reflected in perfect timing. And and the power of Jesus reverses the course of life. Notice the detail given by the author, both in 44 and in 54. I I want to point this out to you if you'll see it. 44 and then 54. Notice the detail given. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. Go to 54. But taking her by the hand. Do you see the detail? She touches him. He touches the girl. And again, we're drawn, if if you're familiar with your Bible, and for the original, definitely the readers of Luke's account, all the alarm bells are going off. All the signals are, are, are pointed toward the Levitical biblical law means... You, you can't touch a woman who has an issue of bleeding or because she's unclean, so now you're unclean. You can't touch a corpse because <laughs> now you're unclean. Jesus is now doubly unclean. Do you see it? I want to point this out to you in Leviticus 15. Here's what it says. If a woman, this is uh, again from the scriptures in Leviticus, if a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, but if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, All the days of the discharge, she shall continue in her uncleanness. For this woman, it's been 12 years of nonstop being ceremonially, ritually unclean in her status among the people and before the Lord. And it says, thus you shall keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleanness. Jesus shouldn't be coming into proximity with this woman. She's desperate. It's, it's, not, it's not a sin to be in a state of uncleanness. Uncleanness does not mean moral uh, contamination. Uncleanness is just a state. There are so many things that make one unclean. Normal things, like having an issue of bleeding. It's normal, everyday Jewish life. There was always people you knew in a state of uncleanness because it just happens in everyday life. You wait a week, the scriptures give instructions. You do a washing. There might be a sacrifice. Or there, there's a cleansing ritual. And then you're, you're back at church. You're back with people. You're back at your family. You're back in a status of cleanness. This is not, she's not morally wrong for having an issue of blood. But what she can't do is disobey the rules about it. Does that make sense? She can't now go to church for 12 years, be around her family, right? This has been a hard, hard 12 years for her. Jesus then goes into this house next and touches a corpse. Again, not a sin to do that. People had to do that back then. But what this would make one is ritually ceremonial in a, in a status or a state of uncleanness. Do you see what the author is setting up here? Jesus is coming in contact with uncleanness. Jesus should be just mounting uncleanness on top of uncleanness now. But do you notice how the course of what actually happened was reversed? This would mean because the bleeding woman touched Jesus, now they're both unclean. This would mean because Jesus touched the corpse, now he's unclean. It doesn't happen. Why? Because she's not a bleeding woman anymore, right? It worked the other way. Instead of uncleanness spreading, his cleanness and restoration spread to her. Why is Jesus not unclean for touching a corpse? Because she's not a corpse anymore. Instead of uncleanness spreading to him, his life and cleanness spread to her. Jesus is reversing the course of life. Do you see it? Jesus' power is reversing the law. It works backwards now. Instead of uncleanness spreading, Cleanness spreads in contact with Jesus. Instead of death spreading, life spreads in contact with Jesus. Uh, But life doesn't normally work this way. That's why it's the power of Jesus we need to reverse the course of life. And here's my comical dad story. This is a dad faux pas. Here we go. Uh, My wife's at home. Our kids are sick. She's going to love the fact I'm saying this on live stream. And I can't even imagine uh, what her her emotions or face might be. She doesn't even know what story's coming here. So uh, here's the story. Uh, 
We don't use dispo uh, sorry, we don't use cloth diapers. We use disposable diapers. And so the normal thing is, man, there's a mess. You you uh, you kind of seal up the diaper and you uh, throw it trashward, right? Let's get that thing out of here. Uh, I guess what happened a few years ago, I don't know how it happened, but it must have uh, somehow got caught up with our dirty laundry pile. Yeah, so we, I, we open up the washer, and inside the washer, the cycle's done, the clothes are clean. You love that, right? And as we're transferring clothes from washer into dryer, <clears throat> diaper pops up. And Amanda's first thought is, oh, no, what? You know, it's just normal parenting. So, oh, what is this, right? Dad, uh, award of the year, I had a joke. I was like, well, you know, it went through the washer. <laughs> it could be clean, right? Be clean. I mean, the clothes are clean and the diaper's clean now, right? That's how it works. It's not how it works. <laughs> the diaper's still a dirty diaper, and now guess what? So is the laundry. I don't think we ever switched it back, though. I think that load just kept going through. Anyway, <laughs> right? But that's how it works. You put something dirty in with clean things, does it become clean? No, it makes everything else dirty. Do you see that? Put a dirty diaper in a load of clean laundry. Does the clean laundry make the diaper clean? No. Dirty diaper makes the laundry dirty. It's how it works. <clears throat> Same with this COVID contact, right? You put someone who has COVID in contact with someone that doesn't. Does the person who doesn't have COVID make the other guy not have COVID anymore? No, now you're both exposed. You see how this works? This is how death works. It's how dirt works. It's how disease works. You put something clean and uncontaminated next to contaminated, both contaminated, right? Only the power of Jesus reverses the course. I don't mean just for dirt or disease, or death, that's not what Jesus intends to do, is make everything dirty clean, and make everything diseased healed. Those are visible, tangible parables of the real, invisible intention he has, to make sinners clean and forgiven. And when you put a sinner in contact with Jesus, your sin doesn't contaminate him, his cleanness and holiness and forgiveness washes over you. And some of you, your blame and your shame and the filth of things you've done and thought and said makes you afraid to come next to Jesus, as if you'll contaminate him. Friend, that's where you got to put yourself. Contact yourself with Jesus in his holiness, forgiveness, and love It washes over you. You don't contaminate Jesus. Jesus restores you. And the miracles here done are, are, are physical parables about Jesus' real ministry. Healing and resurrection are visible, tangible displays of the spiritual healing and spiritual resurrection Jesus does for sinners. Friend, in contact with, with Jesus, your search for unending search, it seems, empty search for significance, it reverses. And through Desperate faith in Jesus, you find all the significance you need. He's the treasure you want. Friend, in contact with Jesus, your, your addiction, your, your besetting sins, in, in connection with Jesus through desperate faith, he restores them, works them backwards, and you find intimacy with God to be, to be brighter and more fulfilling than anything else could be that you're, that you're tasting of. And friend, in connection with Jesus, maybe your critical spirit, your bitterness, your sin, it, it reverses course. And when you see how patient and gracious Jesus is with you, it, it just reverses the attitude of your heart. I don't know where you're at this morning and how you feel spent, how you feel contaminated by sin, how you feel like you need a healing and a resurrection of the heart. Don't distance yourself from Jesus. Don't hide in the crowd and tremble. Come out in the light. Tell the crowd and tell Jesus, just through a touch from you, Jesus, I felt immediate restoration. Friend, come to Christ. And lastly, the people of God. I think we see a, something about the people of God in this story. I'll point out to you a detail. Again, two times the phrase shows up, and it took me a while to think, this can't be a coincidence. 
Why is it here twice? Notice in verse 42, he had an only daughter. Do you see how old she was? 12 years. Go to 43. There was a woman who had discharged her blood. For how long did she have it? 12 years. That means the year of this little girl's birth is when this condition started for the woman. And they both have a duration of 12 years. And on this day, in this story, it's when the little girl's life ended, and it's when this woman's discharge ended. But it's when this little girl was restored to life back to her dad. And it's when this woman is restored now back to her God. Do you see the, do you see the similarities? We're meant to compare in some way, these two lives. What do they have in common? Well, in verse 42 and verse, I believe it is, 49, what's the little girl called? In 42, he had an only daughter. Do you see it? In verse 49, someone from the ruler's house came and said, what? Your daughter is dead. What does Jesus call the unnamed woman in verse 48? It's the only time recorded in the Bible that Jesus calls someone daughter. Why? Jairus got his little girl back. This woman, because of her condition for 12 years, hasn't been to church in 12 years, can't be around friends for 12 years, likely doesn't have a husband because of this, likely doesn't have kids because of this. She hasn't had a hug in 12 years. People can't touch her. She probably hasn't heard anyone call her this in 12 years. Daughter. And this marks the people of God. When you come in desperate faith and find the power of Jesus, you're put back in a family. And now, the supreme God of the universe becomes your father and says of you, daughter. Says of you, son. The people of God share a family because we share Jesus. And now this woman has been invited into something. She, she didn't know this day was going to have this in it, right? She's just touching the fringe of a teacher walking by. And all of a sudden, she's restored like any other. She meets God. And now he says of her, the son of God, daughter. When desperate faith comes in contact with Jesus, he restores relationally to God. He puts you in a family. This marks the people people of God, and what marks them is faith in Jesus. We're sons and daughters, a family with God as our Father. And, and, and Jesus can accept this woman into the family because of how Luke ends. I know we're stopping here in, in chapter 8, but Luke goes on, and the ending of Luke tells us why Jesus can just so freely accept her into the family of God. This woman can be accepted because on a cross later, Jesus will be rejected. And though he's the true child, the true son of God, he, you know when he cries out to the heavens? Father, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is forsaken by his father so that that father can accept you as sons and daughters. Notice how Jesus just so freely dispensed what these two characters needed. Healing for the woman in her issue of bleeding. Life to the little girl when she had met death. Jesus so freely gave out those things because in his ministry and finally at the cross, he is absorbing all the disease and death and sin. And he bled so this woman could stop bleeding. He died so this little girl could come to life. And those are all visible miracles to show us what it's like to experience the real miracle that he was punished so sinners can be forgiven. Friend, this is a picture of faith. It's not having it all together. It's desperate for Jesus. This is the power of Jesus on display. He restores like any other. His power is reflected in perfect timing. And his power reverses the course of your life. 
And friend, I hope that you find Jesus to be that for you. And if so, join the people of God. Join the family of God. Universal, but also local as a part of this church or any Bible-believing church. Friends, we have a mighty Jesus, don't we? Let's trust him with all we have. Let's pray. Father God, thanks for loving us. Thanks for sending Christ. Thanks for being good to us, better than we deserve. God, thanks for your mercy. Thanks for your power, God, for weak people. I pray, God, that in our weakness and desperation, we would find you to be all we need. In your name we pray.